Hello, welcome to the Cisco Telepresence VCS System Configuration Video Guide. This is Part 2A, VCS Configuration. So, let's go ahead and start with the VCS Configuration. We're going to go to Protocols and H.323. Now, there's a couple parameters that I'd like to change in this, and that is the fact that the default time to live is set for 1800. We will want to take and make that 60 seconds. However, we cannot use 60 seconds if this is a polycom endpoint using the VCS. The minimum time to live for polycom endpoint using the VCS uh, is 5 minutes. And that is due to a limitation on the polycom endpoints H.323 stack. The other thing is that I'd like to turn off auto discovery. Uh, this is typically on by default, but I would like to actually go ahead and turn this off. What that means is, is that we don't have uh, one more H.323 gatekeeper discovery multicast uh, packet being sent on the network. I also like to usually configure the caller ID to include the technology service prefix for gateway calls. This appends or prepends the technology service prefix uh, for the ISDN gateway um, for a caller ID. Let's go on to the SIP configuration. Uh, really, there isn't anything that I want to change here, although I do want to change one thing, which is the SIP proxy registration mode. I want to set this to be proxy to known only, and that will allow the VCS to send a registration proxy mode um, to another VCS if it's not the authority for this particular domain. We're going to go on, and in the SIP domains, we're going to make sure that we have at least one dialing domain or one SIP domain here. Uh, this is primarily used for uh, calling. This is not your DNS domains, although it could be the same. Under interworking, uh, we will want to take and probably set this to on. Uh, the default is to register to only. And the reason you might want to leave it registered only is, is if you do have uh, a couple VCSs on your network, uh, you typically don't want to take an interwork all over the place uh, randomly. Uh, you actually want to interwork on your registered VCS. Uh, so this will actually um, allow calls to be interworked between H.323 and SIP only for this VCS. Well, let's continue on, and we're going to go to the registration configuration. Uh, we're going to make sure that this is off um, or none. Um, this is a way that we could actually create some allow lists and deny lists. Uh, those can be read up in the administrative guide uh, for the VCS uh, as well as maybe an advanced uh, session that we might want to do later. So we're going to just leave this to none at the moment. Under authentication, uh, we can supply device authentication. Uh, again, this is a basic configuration, so we're going to leave these off. Uh, so we're just going to go here to the configuration and make sure that it is uh, using the local database, not some remote LDAP database. Um, underneath outbound connection and credentials, this is what the VCS will use when it takes and attempts to register to a firewall traversal server or a VCS expressway. So this is where we might want to put some uh, username and password. Um, you might want to use a little bit more complex username than VCS expressway and maybe a little bit more uh, complex password than this uh, uh, small amount of digits that I have here. Underneath calls, there are two parameters here. Uh, one is a call routed mode. Uh, the default is always. However, if we are in a cluster and we might also have some other VCSs in the network, we might want to set this to optimal. What this will allow is, is it will only take the signaling, the H225, H245, and Q931, if it needs to. So let's go ahead and set this for optimal. Uh, call loop detection mode should be left to on unless you ac actually know what you're doing here, and you might want to set that off for a specific reason, uh, but we're going to leave it on at the moment. This will prevent... Um, uh, LRQ loops from happening on the network. And underneath the local zone, we have a entity called the default subzone. Now, the default subzone is a entity within the VCS. It's a default configuration, and we also have the ability to allow registrations or deny registrations to the default subzone. The default subzone is anything that is 
registered to the VCS that is not classified into another subzone. Those other subzones could be a traversal subzone or it could be actually a configured subzone that we configure on this VCS. Uh, since we can configure several thousand um, subzones, I'm not really going to go into all of those, uh, but we are going to create one subzone. Uh, but before we do the subzones, let's go to the traversal subzone and we'll see the same type of information here about bandwidth. Um, we could take and put a bandwidth restrictions uh, maybe per call. Uh, so this is when media actually flows through the VCS control. So we might want to actually take and put some limitations. We might want to actually do a limit of 2 megabits per second perhaps. Um, why don't we go ahead and just leave it unlimited at the moment. And of course this is the media port since this is a traversal call. And this is for traversal of either firewall traversal, IPv4 to IPv6 traversal, or SIP to 323 traversal or interworking. Let's go on to subzones. And inside of subzones, uh, this is where I typically like to create at least one subzone. Uh, you can have multiple subzones. These subzones could represent um, different parts of the network uh, topology that you might have on your network. Or it might actually just list out, uh, just give me all of the private RFC 1918 um, address spaces. So what I've done here is I've went ahead and created an RFC 1918 subzone. And in the subzone, I have three membership rules as uh, denoted here. Now, I could go to the VCS configuration, local zone, and subzone membership rules. Or I can click on this link in the membership rules here. Click on these three membership rules, and which will take us to the membership rules page. Now in this membership rules page, I have a couple different um, uh, configurations. Um, I see one that I accidentally uh, set incorrectly. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and edit this. I want to actually have the priority of 900. Uh, the reason for that is, is that uh, this is a general uh, rather large um, amount of IP address spaces that I'm just sort of saying I want to take and uh, create a membership rule for. I might want to be a little bit more granular with this in the future, so I may actually want to create another subzone. Maybe that particular subzone is for maybe the Richardson office. So therefore, I would then add another subzone called Richardson maybe, and inside of the Richardson um, subzone, I might want to take and create a couple membership rules for all the subnets that are within Richardson campus. But instead, I actually want to go in here and edit this priority, so I'm going to go in here and view edit uh, this particular um, network. In this particular one, I'm using a subnet, and it's net 192.168.0.0, and I'm using a slash 16. Um, that basically gives me anything that has 192.168.0.0 through 255.255. And my target zone is going to be, of course, the subzone, which is RFC 1918. Uh, but I do want to change the priority of this, so I'm going to increase the number, which decreases the priority and I'm going to hit save. Okay, let's go on and now we're going to go to zones. Uh, and in this case, uh, this is where I have the default zone. This is uh, not deletable. You cannot delete the default subs or the default zone on the box. This is the actual VCS. So the default zone refers to the actual entire VCS, including all subzones within the VCS. Now, I can create neighbored relationships to other VCSs or other gatekeepers or other SIP proxy registrars, including we can actually create a traversal client to a traversal server. So I might want to create a uh, traversal client to connect to a VCS expressway. In here, I've actually just configured the TSBU Alpha VCS, and I see that it is active. So that means that it's able to resolve it and communicate with the far end VCS. In this case, I'm doing so over SIP and 323 because it is a VCS, and I can actually see that I'm active on port 1719 as well as port 5061 TLS. Um, I, if you've, you noticed or not, I, I have been using fully qualified domain names for everything. I could use IP addresses here, uh, but I will prefer to use fully qualified domain names so that if the actual device changes in the future. Um, I don't actually have to remember what the IP address is or remember to come back here and change it. 
um, I can just use the uh, new uh, IP address that got assigned on DNS. Now for each remote zone we can actually treat the particular remote zone as an authenticated um, entity so we, if we receive any calls from that device we can treat those as just pre presume that they're authenticated or we can actually check the credentials and if we check the credentials there's where we actually use the um, the outbound credentials but we're gonna leave the credentials off the moment so we're not gonna check the credentials because this is the basic uh, configuration guide not the advanced configuration guide since the remote zone in this case is a VCS we're gonna leave the default however if it was a Cisco Unified Communications Manager or maybe a Microsoft Link or OCS 2007 server then we might want to take and and create uh, change the zone profile what the zone profile really does is it configures that particular remote zone with a SIP grooming for that particular type of device that we're connecting with. We could use the custom and we could actually define a, a lot of the different parameters that the default ones that we've already created here do. Uh, but we're just going to leave the default again because this is uh, a VCS on the far end. And we're going to get save. And then let's go on. So uh, we're going to skip dial plan. That will be covered in part 2B. And we're going to go to bandwidth, and we're going to look at configuration of bandwidth. Now, the default call bandwidth is really a setting for adding a default call bandwidth to something that did not specify that in the call setup. Some SIP clients do not specify bandwidth in call setup. So therefore, this will insert the bandwidth of 768k in this case which is not the default it's a change from the default so this is the one that I usually like to leave however this is probably one that you want to actually um, use as your default call bandwidth on your network uh, whatever you happen to be using the downspeed per call mode and total mode is set to on by default and I would leave those uh, alone so that um, if an attempt to make a call and we do have a bandwidth restriction that the call still goes through but the bandwidth is reduced and down sped per call as well as in total uh, to the bandwidth limitations that we specified and then let's go on uh, there's a number of different things around links and pipes there's those are really more for advanced configurations uh, but if you would like to look up this information on the administrative guide we can go through um, something in the future perhaps uh, this is where we might want to add a pipe uh, and apply that particular pipe, which is a consumable entity, to a particular link. And in this case, I've applied a T1 from the Richardson to San Jose office, um, and I've applied that to both of the links here. The link from that particular subzone or that particular remote zone to the default subzone as well as the traversal subzone. Let's go on. Now we're going to go to clustering. Underneath clustering, we have the cluster name. This is very important. You must have something resolvable. So this must be resolvable in DNS for the cluster name. This will be used by Mobi clients as well as for E20s, EX60s, and EX90s in the future for device provisioning. So therefore this must be resolvable. Now I don't have any uh, pre-shared key here, but if I wanted to add a another peer member of the cluster I would take and add a pre-shared key here and then I would also provide that pre-shared key on the other member of the cluster when I'm configuring these we would of course add the IP address of the secondary peer in the cluster if we actually had one and then we would also just tell it basically which is the configuration master that I'm going to do um, configurations on this does not have anything to do with which one is a master in the cluster. There is no master in the cluster. All members of a VCS cluster are active, active relationships only. This is only for purposes of configuration only.